Hello, everyone. Happy New Year and welcome to Nittany Game Week. It's show number 20 of 20 for the season. I'm Todd Sadowski along with Jay Paterno and Tom Bradley. Guys, the new year didn't exactly start off the way they want it. The defense shorthanded, the offense disappointing. Season's over. It's the week after. How do you handle a bowl loss? There was nothing worse than a bowl loss because there was no game. And I've lost, you know, when I was coaching, I lost more sleep after bowl losses than anything else because you just don't get to turn around and get started again. Yeah, and it's, it's what are you getting ready for? You get the winter program coming up and you know, the blue-white game, you're not going to worry about that as much. And you can't wait to play again. You can't get the taste out of your mouth until you get to play again, and it's a long wait. Well, interesting. It's the most time you have to prepare for a game and the most time to think about it after nope. it's all yes. said and done. So we talk about opportunities lost, some new leaders emerging, and the current state of the program in our opening drive. Two touchdown loss with Arkansas knocking on the door at the end of the game. Plenty of chances for the Nittany Lions to increase their lead in the first half and stay in the ball game. Jake Pinneger misses a long field goal. Sean Clifford took an intentional grounding to play before that makes the kick much longer. Clifford back to throw, misses Theo Johnson down the middle for a sure six points. And then after that, well, it's the fake punt at the end of the half that Jay was a little puzzling. Yeah, you know, what, you know they, they, after the game, Coach Franklin said that, you know, they were trying to either get a pass interference or get them intercepted. But, you know, if you're going to fake it, uh, go with the play that, you know, you're going to make the play. But I got to say, Jordan Stout's got a pretty good arm on him, though. And, Tom, for the defense, you're missing half your starters. You should maybe want to try and protect them a little bit. Yeah, it's interesting at that point. You could have punted it down to your punters, the great punter, pin them down there and make them, you know, your defense is playing really well at the time. Yeah. yeah, and Brown got that interception after that, which really probably saved some points. And look, this is, to me, the most concerning part of this. This is Clifford throwing an ill-advised pass on first and goal in a double coverage in the fourth quarter. Swelches any kind of rally. Lions had success on the ground, but didn't stick with it. Yeah, I thought, you know, I was really encouraged because early in the game, it looked like they were getting their running backs into a groove. Um, they were getting some good yards. The, the tailbacks averaged 6.7 yards per carry. That's a really good number. And, uh, you know, whatever reason, they, maybe it's because they got behind and they felt like they had to throw to get back in it. Well, it's interesting because, as you know, when you play that 3-3-5 stuff, it's, that's what you want to do is run the ball. There's too many moving parts not to. You know, that's more of a defense that's set up for, to do for against throwing teams of that nature. So, you know, when you get it going, and I thought they had it going early, they had to establish the run early, and I thought they were off to a good start. And Coach Franklin agreed they should not have abandoned the run game. We need to run the ball more consistently. Um, there's no doubt about that. We can't go away from it. Um, we did some good things in the first half. We got to keep those things mixed in, and we, and we didn't do that. Well, I'll tell you who did run the ball consistently, the Razorbacks. Once they figured out passing wasn't necessary, they turned out the yards in the second half, especially an Outback Bowl record, 361 rushing yards against a depleted and worn down Nittany Lions defense. Yeah, but, you know, to their credit, the defense did a great job in the first half keeping, keeping the lead. We mentioned Brown earlier has the interception and uh, two interceptions that really took 10, 14 points off the board. But for those young guys, there's a lot to build on with the guys that you saw playing because of the opt-outs. So yeah. new leaders emerged, Tom, in this game. They sure did, and you could see the younger guys stepping up. They got worn down a little bit as, a, as the game went on, but there's a good base, to, a good nucleus to work with next year. At wide out, Parker Washington filled the, the yeah. feature role of Jahan Dotson nicely, a great one-handed catch there for sure. And Jair Brown is coming back. That He's really going to be able to anchor the secondary. A big interception, two of them in the game, yeah. but especially a big one early on. Yeah, did a great job. And, I, and I, I, like you said, uh, Parker and Washington showed, showed some things in that game that, that you expected from him. But, you know, but Dotson being in there, he takes a lot of those targets away, and now he, he certainly proved his, his worth there. But here's the end result. It's 11 wins, 11 losses in the past two seasons. That counts, of course, the strange and bizarre COVID season of 2020. So not exactly a normal process. But I asked several of the players afterwards, despite some of the quality performances in production, how do you change the final results and win more games? I feel like as we continue to work and get on the same page, and I feel like next year we'll, we'll still have our same OC, and that'll be good to build on because we haven't got that, and I haven't got that since I've been here. So I feel like that'll be big for us, and we'll be able to build on that. We just got to keep putting our head down and keep putting that 1% in. Um, uh, you can't, there can't be success without putting in the work. So we have to just hit winter workouts hard, hit spring ball hard, and hit camp hard, and just keep, keep grinding every day to get 1% better. Yeah, they'll have to find the answers without Jesse Lucetta as well. He announces he's going pro a few hours after the game. Coach Franklin brought some spotlight on Penn State a few years ago with his passionate statement about taking the Nittany Lions from great to elite. 
Yeah, you know, you put that down as a marker and it really hasn't panned out very much that way when you look at the records in the Big Ten since that point. But, you know, I think there's a great opportunity here for Penn State to, when people are doubting you, sometimes that's when you do your best work. And I think, you know, what happens in the next couple of years is going to be critical. Yeah, and I think one of the things I like is that there's some young guys, they have a chance to prove themselves, they have an opportunity to play, they're hungry. So I think a lot of it's going to be how they get started, winter program right off the get-go to the spring. All right, let's go to our scrap metal. Well, this week's scrap metal winner is defensive end Smith Vilbert. Great backstory for this former basketball player, Tom. Big, big guy, and he did a great job in the Outback Bowl. Yeah, he sure did. He's from St. Joe Regional High School, just a redshirt sophomore defensive end. <clears throat> the Nittany Lions only had one player with more than two sacks this season entering the Arkansas game. Vilbert had three sacks in the game first half alone. Well, the guy was mainly a basketball player coming out of high school, Didn't only played one year, and, you know, since it's high school, you watch him, his development will be something that will be quite interesting to watch the next couple of years. And he says some of those skills do translate to football. <laughs> Mostly with footwork, agility, just like being able to just go, for, go from this direction to this direction of a certain amount of speed. I mean, I'm not a guy that celebrates. I was just next play mentality for me. I like that. He's going to make. He's going to be on the field for a lot of plays if he keeps performing like this. He is our final scrap medal winner of the year. Still to come, our final scouting report. The coaches draw some parallels to years past, and we talk about the scouting process for players and parents as they navigate the new world of name, image, and likeness. More Nittany Game Week after this. Tom Bradley Scrap Metal is sponsored by Team DUI, creating a safer and healthier environment for everyone in the Commonwealth. Scouting Report is sponsored by Penn State Health, giving you the care you want where you want it. Visit PennStateHealth.org to find a provider near you. We are back on Nittany Game Week. Time for our scouting report. Our two coaches have been more like professors on the program this year, educating the audience on what to expect in an upcoming game and why or why not something worked in a previous contest. It is the end of our season. Coach Paterno and Coach Bradley offer some perspective about the state of the program and discuss an issue growing in prominence. Well, thanks, Todd. We are going to talk about a little bit about the state of the program. And, you know, there's a little bit of a chicken little, the sky is falling mentality with some fans, and I would caution that. Uh, you're never, you know, it's always evolving. And one of, the se one of the seasons we're going to talk about, Tom, is 1992. The end of that season, Penn State finished 7-5. and five. They had the number one recruiting class in 91. And then those guys really came back and formed the backbone. But it, there was a, a difference in leadership and a difference in approaches, coaching. So, Tom, you were part of it. Talk a little about that run for those next two years? I think one of the things was, you know, uh, Coach Paterno set the stage right after 92. You know, we probably were back a day till we called the staff together and said, hey, we got to talk. We got some things to get done. We have a good group of people. Let's not be negative here. Let's get going. These guys can be really good and they want to be good. So I want you guys to hold hands with them and let's get this thing going. Yeah, and it really made a difference. And the next year they go 10 and 2, the first year in the Big Ten, the following year go 12 and 0. And even then, the next year, the next two years, 95, 96, nine wins, 11 wins, and really did some things. Now, mentioning that era brings me to another off-season topic. Sandy Barber, athletic director, in her interview, talked about James Franklin's contract. And in that, she mentioned the body of work from 2016 to 2019 as being the best four years Penn State had, had in 35 to 40 years. I, I think one of the reasons I wanted to bring that up is I think there are a lot of football players that played in those eras that I think I heard from some, you heard from some, felt a little bit hurt that they had felt like they were a little disrespected. Uh, but when you look at some of these other stretches, there are certainly er er errors in the previous 20 years even that were as good as or if not better than that stretch. And that's no disrespect. It was a great run from 2016 to 2019. Yeah, it's crazy because you're right. I got all the calls coming in. Hey, what about 82 to 86? We played for three national championships. Now, I know it's five years, but they didn't care about that. They wanted to let it be known we played for three national championships. The guys from 77, they start going, hey, we were, you know, 61 and 11 during that fan from 77 to 82, you know. And then they get into the last one. They said, hey, the guys from the 80s are calling, hey, you know, we were 30 – what were they, 32 and 5 or something, yeah. you know, in 80, 80, 81, 82. So, you know, everybody has the pride in their own 
Yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, the, the players, one of the things about it is a lot of those runs came out of seasons just like this one. So there was a great opportunity for Penn State here to do something with it. Now, talk about opportunities. In the last year, name, image, and likeness has become a thing. Uh, it's been a topic of a lot of conversation around the country, Tom. You know how difficult that it, that's got to be for coaches these days. Yeah, it's an it's a unfamiliar territory that they're all trying to figure it out and, and what's the best way to handle it. Because there's a lot of things that, you know, when you, yeah. when you start talking to people, a lot of variables, I don't even know if a lot of people, administrators, players, players' parents have figured out yet that there's going to be a lot of different and things And you led happening. me right to where I wanted to go, Tom. Players and parents, and we're going to talk next. Todd, we did an interview with Courtney Ultimus from Team Ultimus. And they have been, the things you're going to hear from her are very important for, for parents and players to understand name, image, and likeness. And with that, Todd, we'll send it back over to you, the name, image, and likeness star of our crew. Thanks, guys. Outstanding job in the scouting report all year long. Now, much of the name, image, and likeness issue is about educating the players and the parents. That's where companies like Team Ultimus enter the equation. They were already involved in financial literacy with athletes before NIL. Now they can step in and help the families keep from getting burned in a potential deal. But what they don't know and what they have to pay attention to is the ongoing monitoring. You look at so many of the horror stories around professional athletes. Most times, it's not a, a fraudulent person looking to commit fraud and steal from that athlete. It's somebody who the athlete trusts and the relationship starts off well and it goes south and it goes south quickly. So with those two elements, we educate them, we educate them on filtering all of the calls and incoming inquiries and then what to look for and then what to look for going forward. That's really important information for everyone interested in the subject, especially athletes thinking about a name, image, and likeness deal. You can see the entire interview with Courtney at our website, nittanygameweek.com. Well, the football team didn't get the W at the Outback. The Blue Band sure rocks on the road, especially on New Year's Eve. We catch up with them at the Battle of the Bands at Tampa's Busch Gardens. They crushed it. And then later in Ybor City for the Outback Bowl Parade, they steal the show in the downtown district. No surprise because this group can't wait to perform. We really feed off the energy. So if we get a lot of feedback from the fans that want to see us, we're just definitely going to give it more. The music and the weather combined were more than enough reason to make the trip. The Outback Bowl, always a fun New Year's Eve destination. Time to take a break. When we come back, our impact interview, and it's with one of the all-time greats to ever suit up in the blue and white. Linebacker Shane Conlon talks about why no one recruited him but our very own Tom Bradley. Nittany Game Week returns after this. Welcome back. Time for our impact interview. Stop me if you've heard this before. We have a former All-American linebacker as our guest. That's a pretty long list, but this guy undoubtedly one of the all-time greats to wear the blue and white 274 tackles for the Nittany Lions and 186 of them. He didn't need any help. They were solo, a school record. He continued into the NFL where he was all pro three times with the Bills and the Rams. Perhaps most importantly, he was a Tom Bradley recruit. Shane Conlon joins us. Shane, thanks so much for your time. Jay, Tom, and I are really looking forward to talking with you. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. I know we've been trying to put this together for a year now, but I'm glad, glad to be here. <laughs> well, I know we're really excited. Look, I get to fire the first question. So in 1982, you and a number of your fellow classmates redshirted as freshmen right. after loss yep. in that title game in the Orange Bowl to finish the 85 season. Many of you could have gone to the NFL, but you stayed and you won it all in 1986. So what drove that? collective decision and how important was that experience and commitment to one another in that 86 year? Well, I think that we knew going, you know, the 85 year, we were a pretty damn good football team that year too. I mean, we were one, you know, had uh, uh, defensively, I thought it was probably one of our better games. I know Tom can, can refer to that, but we shut down a really high powered offense. So I knew that we were going to be in the hunt again next year. So we just all just said, hey, let's come back. I know I remember I was talking to, to Joe and he said, well, you can leave, but, you know, you might be, you know, but next year you might go, you know, second, third round this year, but next year you'll be a first rounder. So I said, all right, that's all I need to hear. I want to stay anyway. So, but that was great. Uh, 
Shane, you know, in, in, kind of paralleling a little bit to where Penn State is right now. In 1984, uh, you guys finished with a couple of seasons, finished the season with a couple of uncharacteristic uncharac losses. In some yes. ways, that parallels where this program is now. So, what lessons in leadership would you offer to players coming back next year to try and get Penn State back on top in the Big Ten and nationally uh, where they should be? Well, right. I, I think they. I was just. I was a little blown away with how many of the guys just opted out this year to play. And I mean, I, I understand, you know, especially with that kid getting hurt from, uh, you know, the quarterback from what was it, Ole Miss? Yeah, Ole Miss. So, but I, I get it. But I, I just, I don't know, man. I, you, you, we've spent so much time together, and we like, I, I would felt feel like I'd let let the team down if I didn't. You know, we all came in together. We all wanted to live. Uh, to uh, graduate and finish this thing together. So I think, you know, there's a couple guys out of our class that didn't get redshirted, and they were so pissed that they they didn't get redshirted. Like Mike Zordich, who, who is a good friend of mine, who who didn't play a whole lot his freshman year, but he was so pissed he, he wasn't there around for that next, next year. But, you know, what are you going to do? Hey, Shane, I in know. today's world, you would probably have been a no-star recruit, zero stars, okay? And, right. and yet you rank among the best Penn State players of all time. What things in your mental makeup and your drive enabled you to separate from everyone else and become one of the most dominant college football players of your era? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I just think I remember when uh, when I we took the visit uh, with my when my dad. My dad doesn't say a whole lot about football at all. You know, he just lets me be. So he said, he said, you're going to do all right. And I said, I said, yeah, you thinking? Because obviously, Tom, you know, you're the only one that offered. I only had one, one offer, and I'm talking in every division, I, not Division Two. I, I didn't even get looked at Division Three. So, so, uh, and then when I got there, I was like, man, you know, I can play with these guys. I remember that first practice when we were doing one on ones with the tight ends, and I went against uh, Mike McCluskey, who's a great guy, and, you know. But so I got the better of him as a you know, as a true, true freshman. So I think once that stood in and then, you know, I got hurt in, uh, well, I remember Rogers Alexander, he didn't get redshirted. Right. So I was like, cause we were at the same position and uh, I was like, so pissed that he was playing in front of me that uh, honestly, he'll say the same thing about that. So, you know, then we find, found a way to get both of us on the field at the, at the same time. But, uh, but that, that's when it first set in, but that, I don't know if you remember, um, we had fun. Uh, that defense, that scout team, team defense against, you know, Kurt Warner and Blackwood Edge. Yeah, Kurt Warner, he, was, he wasn't he was very happy with some of the stuff we used to do to him. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Hey, hey Shane, I think you took, you popped everybody's eyes when you ran a 4-5 the very first time out of the gate, oh, yeah. okay? Right, yeah, well, yeah, that, that's what uh, I characterize my career as fast and angry. So that's that's how I I I tried to play, you know. Well, Shane, your recruiting story from Tom is one of my favorite stories of the year, and uh, they gave me this question so I could poke the bear a little bit. All right. So recently, there's been some discussion about number 11 being the number for Penn State linebackers, but others yeah. would argue number 31 should be the right. number for Penn State linebackers, given the national and Big Ten titles won, the three All-American national honors by guys yep. who wore number 31, you, Andre Collins, Paul Puzlesny. Would it be fair to say that you started a pretty impressive legacy of your own? Yeah, no, that was great. It was great. I, you know, I was honored. I, I remember when uh, <clears throat> um, Andre, or, or Andre Collins, he, he said, he was, below, he was there right after me, right? And he's like, hey, you mind if I take your, I said, you don't have to ask me, I'm done. I said, you can take any number you want. He said, and then I started laughing. I said, I'd be honored if you take it. And he, you know, he did. And what a career he had, too. So I don't know, but what that number 11 for Dallas is doing now is pretty, pretty unbelievable. We are just getting started with our interview. Shane's going to stick around with us, and we're going to step aside for the TV show to take a break. We will continue our interview with Shane Conlon. So if you want to see the entire conversation and with one do. of the best linebackers, right, and you do, Jay, in Penn State history, make sure you go to NittanyGameWeek.com for the entire interview along with other web-exclusive content. Still to come, some final thoughts on our very first Nittany Game Week, and we sign off with our Outback Bowl pride picks. We appreciate everyone sharing their photos with us this year. We're heading into the final minutes on Nittany Game Week. 
Time to wrap up not only the show, but the season. And I want to show you this first. It's kind of a sports reporter time capsule. Here we go. January 1st, 2022. Standing outside Raymond James Stadium in Tampa for the Outback Bowl. So why am I showing you this? Well, 21 years earlier, here I am at about the same spot outside Raymond James covering the Ravens and Giants in the Super Bowl. A lot of fun events and games in between. The side-by-side, -side. the guy on the left looks like an intern who was lucky to be hired. The one on the right is still grateful for the opportunities. As you mentioned, Kerry Collins was the starting quarterback, Jay, in that game again for the Giants. That first picture could have been from show one, though, the final one from show 20, because that's how much I feel like I aged this year. A lot of work, but it's been worth it. I've really enjoyed season number one. Hope you guys have, too, some of your favorite moments from the year. Well, it's been great. You know, I, I think I want to thank all the people, sponsors, all the stations along the line. Built a great network, gotten a lot of great feedback, and it's been a lot of fun to do this every week. You know what I've enjoyed the most is just talking to the guys and seeing them on camera and, and watching how they've you know, grown up and going back and forth and how much you miss and how many great memories you had with those guys, just being around them, and it was a lot of fun. That's what I appreciate the most is being drawn into the old players and your guys' stories and all those connections because it's, it's lifelong relationships that you guys have built with a lot of these people. Yeah, and I've also enjoyed really breaking down we, the, the scout report every week as well. It's been a lot of fun to do that. And, and uh, you know, all the people that watch the show, thanks so much, and we're going to see you next year. Once a coach, always a coach. You guys have done a fantastic job. Appreciate it. All right, a lot of fun. Well, don't miss our depth chart at NittanyGameWeek.com, which includes these local businesses. Our goal is to build a team in the community that supports the show and that you, in turn, support as a viewer to keep our hometowns strong. Just because you won't see us for 30 minutes every week until August, that doesn't mean you can't keep track of what we're doing. Make sure to visit NittanyGameWeek.com to see the segments and shows from this past season. We'll keep things fresh with a series of off-season online interviews for you to check out. It all happens at NittanyGameWeek.com. As we mentioned, been a fun and exciting first season. Can't wait to do it again in year number two. For Jay and Tom, I'm Todd. Thanks so much for watching Nittany Game Week. We'll see you next time.